Today at the National Press Club, author and science journalist John Entine, the founder and executive director of the Genetic Literacy Project, will discuss the anti-genetically modified food debate and whether we can sustainably feed generations to come. John Entine with today's National Press Club address. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Press Club for today's Westpac Address and welcome, of course, to our colleague. Uh, always a pleasure to have a journalistic colleague join us uh, here as a guest, John Entine, uh, award-winning science journalist and author, a senior research fellow at the University of California's Institute for Food and Agricultural Literacy. Our guest has uh, spoken strongly in favour of the science of genetic modification. In the process, he's become a high-profile target for the anti GM food movement following publication of a number of books, among other things, on the issue, including uh, the title Let Them Eat Precaution, How Politics is Undermining the Genetic Revolution. To discuss uh, GMOs and the future of sustainable farming, would you please welcome today's speaker, John Entine. Thank you very much. I'm really very thrilled to be here at the National Press Club and Thrilled to be in Australia. This is my first visit um, to the country, and when I realized I was um, going to be coming here to do a number of um, talks and involved in a very important conference on the future of biotechnology here in Australia and, and, and in the world, I did take the opportunity to get here a few days early um, because it's the last weekend of the regular season of the Australian Football League. Um, so I wouldn't want to miss that, never having been here before. Um, so I did go to a game. Uh, on Saturday. Uh, it's the end of the season. Uh, was at MCG in Melbourne and saw um, Collingwood versus Essendon. Obviously not the top of the league. Uh, I came here with a charge from my 17-year-old um, daughter, high school daughter, and she says, bring back a souvenir, bring back a jersey from one of the teams. So I discussed this with her. Uh, and basically it came down to who do we choose? Is it the uh, Bulldogs or the Magpies? And um, uh, don't want to rile the audience too much, but I am now officially a magpie. <laughs> and all of, I, 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 knew, I knew I was going to lose about half the audience here. I just want to say all of you who booed will be dive bombed by a magpie before the end of this, um, before the end of this time here. Uh, well, what I'm about to talk about today, uh, I lost half the audience. And what I'm about to talk about today actually may lose the other half of the audience. Um, I had the opportunity uh, earlier this week on Monday to, um, to go to two interviews on ABC, one on radio, one on television. What was remarkable about the interviews is that both of the interviewers began their questioning with diatribes against Monsanto, uh, how it controls the world, the food supply, has turned poor farmers into seed slaves, on and on. You've heard the story, the Monsanto is evil story. I found it simplistic. It's out of touch with what's really going on in farming here in Australia and in the world. And in fact, I'll put myself on the line and state flat out, here's the rest of the audience I'm losing, Monsanto is not an evil company. And no, it does not control the food supply. And yes, it is one of the good guys in agricultural biotechnology. Let me provide some context why most scientists, regulators, and farmers across the ideological spectrum, people really there on the ground, have come to the exact same conclusion as I have. I know it's not a popular conclusion, but it is the one I think that the intelligentsia, the liberal progressive intelligentsia, even in the United States, um, embrace. I've been a journalist for more than 40 years. I'm a skeptic by training and politically progressive by ideology. I distrust corporations by instinct. But I can't quite, hmm, but I can't quite grasp this Monsanto hate. It's a sizable company, sure, but in global terms, not so much. Think about this. There are more than 1,000 companies that supply the commercial seed market globally. Monsanto's market share, less than 5%. Starbucks' annual revenue is about the same as Monsanto. It's smaller than the gap, less than one-third the revenue of Coca-Cola. Not only is Monsanto not the embodiment of rogue company, I'll flip the accusation. It's one of the good guys. It's a visionary. I've spent much of my career reporting on socially responsible businesses, including 14 years as board member with the British magazine Ethical Corporation. I can tell you flat out that Monsanto is admired in ethical business circles for its transparency and innovation. Monsanto is to agriculture as Apple is to communications technology. 
Both companies are sprawling giants. Like any large organization, Greenpeace comes to mind. They do questionable things at times. But because of their commitment to research and development, Apple and Monsanto attract the best and the brightest scientists in the world. Why then is there such skepticism about Monsanto and by extension the use of genetic modification to improve farming? Let's ground this abstract question in the real world. Why do so many people celebrate Apple while demonizing an apple that doesn't brown, saves billions of dollars in waste, and preserves the antioxidants that make apples a healthy food choice? I'm referring to the Arctic apple. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's one of the newest genetically engineered foods. It recently received the go-ahead from U.S. and Canadian regulators. It's the world's first sustainable fruit. For a long time, the central concern of GMO opponents revolved around the belief that transferring genes from one species to another, a process known as transgenics, opened the door to safety and health concerns. Here is a scare headline I came across on the internet preparing for this talk. Plants unable to physically reproduce can create a kind of botanical Frankenstein. Frankenfood, you've heard the term. You've no doubt seen pictures on the web of pictures on the web of tomatoes with fish bodies and children threatened by marauding GMO vegetables. What does this have to do with the Arctic apple? Well, the sustainable apple represents the leading edge of what might be called biotech 2.0. It contains no so-called foreign genes. We are now entering the age of NBTs, new breeding technologies. Ag scientists can now tune, slice, snip, and splice DNA without adding genetic material from different species. The Arctic apple was made by a process known as gene silencing, which involves dialing down the expression of genes, in this case, those that control the production of the chemical that causes browning. The technology, by the way, was developed here in Australia by CSIRO and licensed to Arctic apple because of the regulations in Australia that does not allow this country to exploit its own technology. Sadly, restrictions in place here make it almost impossible for Australia to reap the rewards of this country's advanced genetic research. Other countries and companies run with it. Browning, by the way, is not necessarily a sign that a fruit has gone bad, as GMO critics claim. Apples go brown almost as soon as they are sliced, but don't go bad for days or uh, uh, for hours or days. When your kid decides not to eat a slice of apple from his lunch, he's throwing away a safe and healthy food. Another thing that's so cool about our apple is that it's not the work of Monsanto or any large ag company. Rather, it was guided through the regulation maze by a handful of Canadian entrepreneurs. It takes, on average, 13 years to certify a new GMO crop at a cost of about $136 million U.S. Sweat equity aside, the Arctic apple costs $5 million, $7 million, one two-hundredth of what GMOs traditionally spend. That's the promising future. That's the NBT future if we keep activist critics from blocking the door to innovation. Arctic apple is a dazzling achievement. It cuts waste and results in an antioxidant richer fruit. In a word, it's more sustainable. That's the key word, sustainable. This is today's story. Sustainable agriculture should be the focus of our food debate, not scare stories about frankenfoods, but how we can feed the growing global population while using less water and less chemicals on less arable land. I'm not going to spend much time addressing the controversy over the safety of GMO foods today because there is no controversy over the safety of GM foods, not in mainstream science circles. As of this week, I counted 244 global science organizations, including Food Standards Australia New Zealand, that have concluded that GM foods are as safe or safer, in many cases they conclude they're safer, than conventionally bred varieties, and that includes organic foods. A lot of safety problems related to organic foods. According to FSANZ, gene technology has been shown, has not been shown to introduce any new or altered hazards into the food supply. I've been able to identify only one organization that challenges this consensus. It's known as ENSER, which stands for the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, based in Europe. ENSER's founder and inspirational hero is Gilles-Éric Serralini, a French scientist 
best known for a controversial study published three years ago. Serolini fed rats corn and the herbicide glyphosate, which is often paired with GMO crops. They cause cancers, he claimed. He showed pictures of it. His minions flooded the internet with pictures of rats twisted by tumors. The anti-GMO community celebrated these grotesque pics. Hmm. The anti-GMO community celebrated these grotesque pictures. It was Christmas in September. Their prayers were answered. GMOs could kill. They were very, very, very happy of Seralini's findings. Well, that's not the way mainstream science saw it. FSANZ and every major regulatory body in the world, bar none, reviewed, eviscerated is a better word for it, this study. Poor controls, the rats used were genetically bred to develop quick tumors, manipulation of the data, dozens of anomalies. The notorious Seralini study, the lumpy rat study as it's called, was eventually retracted. But like a zombie, it was republished without peer review in what's known as a predatory journal, a pay-for-play journal, a publication where any GMO scientist finds an afterlife. Seralini bought his way into the republication of that retracted journal. Australia has a card-carrying member of ENSER, Judy Carman, you may have heard of her, a nutritional biochemist who runs her own NGO, the Institute for Health and Environmental Research. Sounds very impressive. Doesn't have an office? Just a post office box. Carmen does have a website. It's run by the same anti-GMO group that created Seralini's website. I've been warned I should be cautious about discussing Carmen's work because she and the activist group she works closely with, the Safe Food Foundation, are, notorious, are notoriously litigious. All I can say is, bring it on, Judy. Carmen's claim to fame was a study published in an obscure journal that concludes that pigs fed GMOs develop grossly inflamed stomachs. Her findings were odd because we have lots of evidence about how GMOs impact animals. Globally, food-producing animals consume 70 to 90 percent of GE crop biomass, more than one trillion meals over almost 20 years. That's what we call a long-term independent GMO health study. Europe, which everyone thinks hates GMOs, is the world's second largest importer of them, most of it used to feed livestock. Yet globally, there is exactly zero, zero empirical evidence to support Carmen's claims. No studies, no data. No surprise, her research was evaluated and dismissed by major global regulatory agencies, including here in Australia. To mainstream scientists, Carmen's and Seralini's research are carnival sideshows that distract policymakers from the genuinely important challenge. How will we feed 10 billion people by 2050 without compromising our ecological future? Sustainability is one of the buzzwords of our time. I've been writing about environmentally sound business practices for more than a quarter of a century. I'm the guy who, term, who coined the term greenwashing to signify those who use the cloak of green to promote suspect products. So count me as a skeptic when it comes to assumed virtues of green farming, of organic farming. I rely on empirical evidence, and I hope increasingly regulatory agencies will as well. I draw my questioning sensibility from that prototypical American, Mark Twain. Plain spoken, can spot a phony from a kilometer away. Maybe you've read about his famous tour through Australia in 1895 in his book about that visit, Wayward Tourist. Australian history is almost always picturesque, he wrote. It does not read like history, but the most beautiful of lies. Twain was a master at capturing the irony of life. I've reimagined what he might have, said, might have thought witnessing today's food wars, bombarded as we are by claims that so-called natural foods are healthier than conventional foods or those involving GMOs. Trust us, say organic evangelists. Pay twice as much for our food. It's a small price to pay to protect your kids. Twain would have called that true What anti-GMOers dismiss as corporate agriculture is by and large far more sustainable than smaller scale agroecology and organic farming. Better for the land, better for our children. Reality check, growing food is the antithesis of natural. It requires battling weeds and destroying ravenous bugs. Many foodies disconnected from the farms that feed them don't appreciate that we've been bending nature to suit the needs of humans for thousands of years. Consider corn. It supplies one-fifth of human nutrition. It descends from an ancient wild grass with relatives in Mexico today known as teosinte. It's always had kernels, but not the luscious yellow ones we take for granted. 
Rather, it had indelible black nubs that could crack a tooth. Then humans intervened. Beginning 10,000 years ago, our ancestors began to randomly experiment on this grass with hard buds. Through trial and error, cobs became larger and more edible and added rows of kernels. Today, sweet corn yields 100 times more than teosinte, a testament to genetic modification. Some people are shocked when they find out the origins of many modern crops, foods they unthinkingly believe are nature's grace. For example, cabbage, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. They are all related, by the way, created by human ingenuity from a barely edible mustard weed. The need to create new and healthier foods accelerated in the 1900s as the world ex population exploded. Many were created in labs, and I'm not referring to GMOs. Anybody here like ruby red grapefruits? Is that an American food, or is that something you can get here in uh, Australia? Get it in Australia, probably. Uh, Italian pasta made from high-end durum wheat, Vietnamese rice, organic beer and whiskey. Had an organic beer just the other day. If you're a devoted foodie, you can pick up these specialties at your local organic grocery. That way you can avoid the taint of dangerous GMOs. You know, foods created in laboratories by white coat scientists, untested and unlabeled, ticking health time bombs, Franken foods. Whoops, better change your menu because each of these foods and 2,500 more were created in steel wall laboratories by scientists in white coats more than likely. Even worse, they were created using chemicals and nuclear radiation that shattered their chromosomes, and they are all sold as organic foods. The process is called mutagenesis. It was discovered in the 1920s, but is still in use today. Have these lab-created mutants ever been tested? Nope. Are they labeled? Nope. Makes the Frankenstein argument that organic foods are safe because they are grown in harmony with nature kind of silly, yes? Preparing for this trip and only distantly familiar with how the debate over GMOs has played out on Australian shores, I thought it would be a good idea to meet some local farmers. I spoke with John Snook. John's here, actually, for this talk. I'm thrilled that he had a chance to come here. John grows conventional barley and lupins and some GMO canola on 5,000 acres in the central wheat belt here. The farm has been in the family for 70 years. His mom and dad still work the fields with him and his wife. Why did John begin farming GMO canola a few years ago? Because it's so challenging to grow food in Western Australia, he told me. The snooks battle frost in the spring, and drought is always a threat. Weeds are challenging. He controls them in part by using herbicide-resistant GM canola. Growing GM canola has also allowed him to increase his use of no-till farming, one of the great sustainability uh, innovations encouraged by GMO crops. No-till results in a sharp reduction in the release of greenhouse gases from the soil. In the last five years since we started growing GM canola, we've taken our sustainability efforts to a new level, he told me. He now uses less chemical inputs and has increased his yields. GM techniques are not a break from traditional farming practices, but an intensification of them. It's producing more on less land while consuming fewer resources. It's harnessing technology, not running from it. If we do not embrace the future, we risk ending up like the Luddites. Not sure everyone's familiar with the term Luddites. The Luddites were early 18th century English activists who aggressively opposed the Industrial Revolution. It was disruptive of the pastoral life. They destroyed machinery, kind of the way Greenpeace ravaged GMO vitamin-enhanced rice test fields in the Philippines, and wheat plots at an experimental farm here in Canberra. Like Greenpeace today, the Luddites fashioned themselves as liberal reformers. Today, the word Luddite is synonymous with just the opposite, backwardness. It means fear of innovation. It means a fear of technology. Here is what Greenpeace opposes today. Just a few weeks ago in the US, the government gave a preliminary green light to a new potato. It goes by the trade name Innate, and it's a great example of the sustainability revolution in agriculture ignited by GMO technology. It embodies everything the Greenpeace despises, the linkage of sustainability and technology. You've heard of the Irish potato famine. By the 1840s, much of Ireland's economically depressed population had come to depend on the potato for their diet. But in 1845, a disease known as late blight appeared. Potatoes rotted in the fields. It was a devastating period of disease and starvation. The same disease more recently destroyed half of the tomato crop 
in the eastern United States. There is no antidote, or there has been no antidote. Science now has a protection plan, a genetically modified potato. Because this new breeding technique does not involve the transfer of any genes, US regulators expeditiously approved two generations of it over the past year. The DNA in version one was tweaked to resist browning and bruising, lower sugar content, and reduce by 90% the presence of a chemical produced in potatoes that when fried might lead to birth defects and cancer. The second generation allows for potatoes to be stored at colder temperatures longer, which reduces food waste. It requires fewer pesticides and less water. It's resistant to a potato-killing moth, and it contains blight resistance. In short, the innate potato is an ecological bonanza. Activists, British-based GMO Watch, what do they say about it? They call it superfluous. It's been attacked by every major GMO group in Australia and in the world. Sustainable apples and potatoes are just the tip of the GMO innovation iceberg. Salmon that goes twice as fast as conventional varieties, saving lots of resources. Oranges engineered to beat back the bacterial plague, threatening to destroy Florida's iconic fruit. Bananas genetically inoculated against a disease, the Cavendish banana, might actually go extinct if we don't have a GE solution for it. The American chestnut tree, near extinction, engineered for revival, only being blocked by anti-GMO activists. Vitamin-enhanced rice, cassava, and sorghum. Anti-GMOers dismiss these biotech 2.0 innovations as Trojan horses that divert attention from the Monsanto GMO capitalist world domination plan. The real problem, they say, are GMO commodity crops, corn, cotton, canola, soybeans. What about pesticide treadmills, superweeds, monoculture? Those crops make animal feed, junk food, and biofuels. What's so sustainable about them? Here's the most important takeaway that I can give you today. Across most measures, even GMO commodity crops are more sustainable than organic alternatives. About half of the major GMO crops have been genetically engineered to produce a natural protein known as BT, short for bacillus, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, thuringiensis, is that how you pronounce this? Thuringiensis, all right, not so bad. This is a bacterium found naturally in soil that is lethal to bugs. That lethal to bugs that munch on crops. It's so effective that organic farmers have been spraying it themselves on crops for nearly a century with zero concerns. One rub, however, is that its effect doesn't last very long. So repeated spraying by organic farmers is necessary. Along came scientists who figured out a way to insert that natural protein into corn, cotton, eggplant, and other crops, eliminating the need to spray insecticides. It's a huge sustainability success story. GM cotton farmers in Australia have cut pesticide use by 95% in 20 years, 95%. Farmers no longer breathe in potentially dangerous insecticide. What about the, what about the pesticide treadmill? The other chemicals, glyphosate, you've heard talk about those kinds of things. Why not opt for organic farming? After all, it doesn't use pesticides, myth busted. In the U.S., the Ag Department lists 11 pages of approved organic pesticides and herbicides, including cancer-causing agents like copper sulfide. It's approved because it's natural. It also causes cancer. Australia has a similar list. Simply said, bugs and weeds love crops. All farmers need and use chemicals, whether they're an organic farmer or whether they're a conventional farmer. And despite claims to the contrary, GMO crops have not resulted in an increase in the use of chemicals, much the opposite. The most definitive research on this issue released last year found GMO crops bumped yields 22%, cut pesticide use on average 37%, and jumped profits 68%. That's a trifecta. Going forward, raising yields while reducing environmental impacts requires ever greater precision. In a rational world, environmental activists would be in the streets demanding more GMO crops, and they would openly acknowledge the sustainability challenges of organic agriculture. Costs are higher, it's labor intensive, it rarely uses no-till agriculture, which helps prevent the release of climate change causing greenhouse gases, it requires the use of more carbon-eating mechanical equipment, and it relies on cows, which unfortunately fart a lot. <laughs> That's more than just an embarrassing observation. It's a sustainability disaster. Cow rele cows release methane gas, a greenhouse gas 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It may sound humorous, but cows are the single biggest contributor to global warming, more than 
fossil fuels. Futurist and former Google scientist Ramaz Nam has analyzed why organic farming would reduce and not promote sustainability. If we wanted to reduce pesticide use and nitrogen runoff by turning all of the world's farmland to organic farming, he said, we'd need around 50% more farmland than we have today. The world would need an additional five to six billion head of cattle to produce enough manure to fertilize that farmland. Combined, we need to chop down roughly half the world's remaining forests to grow crops and graze cattle that produce enough manure to fertilize those crops. Clearing that much land would produce 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide, or almost as much as the total cumulative carbon dioxide emissions of the world thus far to date. The message is sobering. Want to preserve rainforests and our fragile climate? Embrace GM crops. Organic farming just does not cut it. If the yield of a specialty organic crop like heirloom tomatoes, um, uh, if the yield of a special crop like heir heirloom tomatoes is something that you embrace, that means very little in the greater scheme of things. It's just not a big crop. But there is a yawning gap on commodities uh, in terms of yield, from 29% on commodity corn to 53% on spring wheat. The vegetable gap ranges from 21% for sweet corn to 57% for cabbage, except for apples, where the lag averages a hefty, but relatively small, in this case, 12%. The drag for organic fruits can be as high as 57% in oranges. These eye-opening figures are not from Big Ag. They are from the US Department of Agriculture. It's time we put to rest the eco-romantic notion that we can feed the world through organic farming. The reality is that small-scale food systems actually enlarge the messy human footprint. We need to evaluate who we can trust, who we should listen to when we have discussions about the future of food in Australia and in the world. It's not Seralini, it's not Greenpeace, and it's certainly not Judy Carman. The people who campaign against GMO foods aren't informing you or protecting you. They're using you. They're trying to jack up your anxiety. Keeping you scared is the key to their political and marketing strategy and a way to grow organic business, the organic business golden goose. Organics is now a $130 billion worldwide Goliath. That's four to five times the market size of the biotech seed industry. Sure, let's encourage organic farming for those of us who can afford it. But let's not kid ourselves. To meet the needs of our expanding global community of hungry children, we need large-scale, highly productive, high-technology agriculture. Call it industrial agriculture, if you will. I call it sustainable farming. And it's embraced by the most influential future-focused thinkers in the world, including Bill Gates. I asked John Snoop what he might say to those of you who criticize farmers here in Australia for adopting GM seeds or wanting more GM products in the marketplace here. This is what John told me. It's the breeding technique of our generation. To get higher yields and not waste the soil, we need all the tools available. If we delay the t development of GM crops because of fears of technology, I could almost visualize him shaking his head on the other end of the telephone. If we get rid of GM crops, if the activists win, it will send a strong signal to our, to our Australian research community that there is no path to market. That's not good for Australia, and that's not good for the world. Let that be our guiding thoughts going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, before we begin today, I, I asked you, would you be prefer to be referred to as a strong supporter or a passionate advocate of GM? And your response was, no, I'm neither. I'm a believer in the science. Uh, now, you've been accused, I made the point at the outset that you've become a target for the, uh, the anti-GM uh, lobby, if you like. You've been accused of being a, a corporate propagandist, a, a pseudo-journalist, I think you'd be called, be called a lot worse, in fact, which I won't go to, and <laughs> it's some of the, the material I read, who, who, who simply uh, promotes the opinions and positions of uh, big chemical companies, and you mentioned one uh, quite a bit. What would you say to that criticism? How do you respond to that? I think it's difficult when you're reporting on any kind of issue to not be um, associated with the positions um, that you take. In, in my case, I think I mentioned to you I'm a skeptic on all issues of science, and I think anyone who looks at the Genetic Literacy Project, which 
it's a nonprofit NGO, no industry funding. We've been in existence for almost five years now. Recognizes that there are no sacred cows. If you're a journalist, um, there's blood in the water, you're a piranha, you report on what the facts are. Um, I think we're in a, an odd situation where if industry happens to be on the right side of an issue, you are automatically assumed to be a shill for industry. Um, that's an unfortunate way to look at the science. Um, by that kind of measurement, the entire liberal journalism establishment in the United States are shills for industry because the New York Times, the Washington Post, Scientific American, the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, the Denver paper, the Oregonian, every single one of them has come out for the safety of GM products. Every one of them has come out against mandatory labeling, the kind that's being promulgated in the United States, because it's deceptive the way it's being put out. So are they shills for Monsanto? Are they beholden to corporations? I mean, if you want to believe that, that's a corporate conspiracy theory that I think drives a lot of the anti-GMO movement. All I can say is I'll stand by the science and I'll communicate the facts um, the best that I know them. If someone wants to avoid discussing and engaging the argument itself and engage in ag uh, argumentum ad hominem, that's fine. That, I think, essentially reveals the bankruptcy of their argument. There are real issues here. Sustainability is a real concern. Let's stick to the facts. Let's stick to the science. Let's stick to the politics. Um, let those issues essentially define how this debate will go forward. A question now from Colin Bettles. It's on. It's on. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes, I've done this before, Morris. Thank you. <laughs> um, appreciate it. Uh, congratulations, John, on your talk and for being a Collingwood supporter. Perhaps they could come up with a GM plant that increases uh, teeth health for some of your supporters, <laughs> supporter base. Uh, just to quickly, um, in terms of reporting on uh, GMs, what do you think is the, the fatal mistake that media make in covering the issues that you've outlined in your talk? And given what you've said uh, about Greenpeace activism and uh, biotechnology, where to now for, for Greenpeace? What should they do? Uh, on the first issue, I think the, there's something, a concept in journalism called false equivalency. When you're doing an article about whatever, GMO safety, which has been in the news for many, many years, that it's less and less a debate because I think the safety issue has pretty much been put to bed. Um, but typically, if you have a controversy, maybe the Marsh uh, Baxter issue, you talk to one side, you talk to the other, and, and you try to present both sides of an issue. What happens when the issue is not a 50-50 in terms of how the science world sees it? What happens if it's 80-20 or 90 um, or 90-10, in the case of GMO safety, 90% of mainstream scientists think it's safe. So I think the real problem with journalists, and I see this in Australia, you have a story and they have a scientist making a, a point. Lots of times they will automatically say uh, industry supports a position, and they might even quote an industry scientist. That's just kind of a subtle way of degrading the quality of that argument. But then they go to the other side, and they'll go to someone like Judy Carman, and you see her in a lot of articles in the Australian press, and somehow a world-renowned um, scientist, maybe the president of the National Academy of Sciences in, 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 uh, in the United States, um, a prestigious worldwide investigator, suddenly is put on the same platform, the same level, as someone like Judy Carman, whose work is discredited largely. Um, and, and, and the average reader cannot make their way through that. All they see is, huh, here's one argument, here's the other argument, and, and it's equal. That kind of false equivalency has to stop. We have to say what the science is, and just because industry supports it doesn't mean that mainstream scientists don't support it. And I think journalists have really, really failed um, in, in the way they're contextualizing a lot of the stories about GMOs. This debate over science just doesn't exist in the science world. It's a highly politicized debate driven by two, two things. Anti-GMO activists who are very suspicious, have a precautionary view of the world, but it's driven by the organic industry as well. Every time there's a negative article about GMO conventional foods, the price of an, uh, organic foods goes up and the profits of organic companies goes up. They profit from demonizing. They don't do pro-organic advertising anymore. They don't do pro-organic um, uh, marketing. They do anti-GMO marketing. They do scare stories. And I think that's a very dangerous precedent. Before I go to the next question, I might, you referred to the Marsh-Baxter case, and I might just uh, make the point for our viewing audience, if they didn't quite connect on that, that relates to the Steve Marsh uh, case in Western Australia, where he lost his appeal, I think, last week or the week before, uh, for uh, compensation uh, due to the effect of uh, GM crops from uh, his neighbour, Baxter. So I'll go to my next question now. Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. Uh, at least 15 years ago, when I was uh, in a previous life, the science editor at the Canberra Times, a local paper here, uh, 
I remember going across to uh, CSIRO, you mentioned CSIRO in your speech, uh, to a launch of a GM potato. And we ate uh, what you call French fries, what we call chips. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was approved as a, as a safe food. Uh, but, uh, and the company that had funded the research was proposing to bring it onto the market, but they never did because of um, just the judgment that uh, it was going to be too difficult to market because of the GMness. Um, that, that kind of surrender, um, you're a, a very aggressive and entertaining um, um, advocate for, for not only GM farming but, but modern farming, um, science-informed farming. But something that goes through your, your talk is a kind of defensive irony. You talk about losing the audience, you know, and you, you're almost like you're in the corner punching, but you know you're going to lose. I figure you probably realise that the, the message has to evolve, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you have any, any kind of insights into how that may be. And just a, a second uh, question. I know that the anti-GM forces are very active in Africa, and Africa is a place where GM crops could be really useful for subsistence farmers. I wonder if you've got any views on that. I'll address the second one first. Actually, it should be good news in the next month or two. Kenya appears poised to lift its ban on GM crops, which is a great opportunity. And you talk about disinformation. I work with a lot of journalists in Africa. I have a few of them who write for me. And they tell heartbreaking stories about anti-GMO activist groups who go around telling um, uh, poor people that uh, GM crops will make them sterile um, or causing all kinds of problems. And the illiteracy is just high enough that those kinds of scare campaigns actually get some, get some traction. But you talked about what might change the debate. I think what, what, what might change the debate, and frankly it poses an interesting challenge and opportunity here in Australia, is what I call the, the NBTs, the new breeding technologies. Um, you, we have the development of the RNA um, Interference technology that's behind uh, Arctic Apple that was developed here in Australia. That's gene shears, is it? I'm sorry? Is it gene shears? Gene, gene shears. shears. Yes, uh, it's, but, but it was developed here and exported to Canada. Um, but, the, but the reality of it is there's a lot of GM, gene, gene editing and related technologies that don't involve transgenics, that don't Im involve moving genes from one um, species to another. And they're not as expensive. They're actually easier to do. They don't necessarily involve the regulatory maze that currently exists. This poses an opportunity because anti-GMO activists are right now trying to figure out ways to shoehorn these new technologies under really antiquated regulatory structures that exist here in Australia and in Europe and the United States as a way to block non-GMO gene editing technology. So I'm really hopeful that the science community can work very, very carefully with the regulatory community uh, community in, in keeping some license to operate in developing new technologies that do not involve uh, DNA transfers from one species to another and allow these really low-cost technologies which have enormous potential to develop. So I think we're really hopeful that the true sustainability possibilities in genetic engineering might be realized if this opportunity is not lost, like I think the opportunities to develop GMOs was lost in the 1990s. Uh, Natalie Kotsius. Hi there, John. Thank you very much for your speech today. Sure. Um, just continuing on in a similar vein to the previous two questions, perhaps, but why do you think there's, very generally speaking, a, a broad public perception that um, climate scientists are correct on climate change but a reluctance to believe crop scientists? And is this exclusively a fault of the media or what else needs to happen to get the message out? What can governments do? What can industry do? That's a great question. I think a lot of people... Um, uh, make the point of saying, well, at least in the United States, I think it's um, probably similar here, that progressive-minded people embrace the science of climate change, um, and the people who oppose it, at least in the United States, tend to be ones who are more conservative. So the kind of um, explanation of that is conservatives are reject science. Uh, why liberal-minded people, not always confusing the term liberal here in Australia, progressives um, are more embracing of it. And uh, that has posed a problem because here we have GMO science that, at least in the United States and I think in many other countries, uh, many so-called progressive people are rejecting that. H how do you explain this cognitive dissonance? Um, I would say that 
people who are liberal-minded are not embracing the science of climate change. They're embracing the ideology of climate change. Their views on climate change really rests on an antipathy to large corporations who they believe are behind um, the fossil fuel industry. Um, they are suspicious of large energy companies. And when they embrace, uh, embrace the science of climate change, what they're really saying is we think um, large energy companies are problem creators. We think that they're greedy. And we think they've created an energy and ecological problem um, that's going to be with us for centuries. So I think that political ideological evaluation is mistaken for being a science one, which will, does explain exactly why those very same people reject GMO science, because there they use the same model. They assume that GMOs are developed by the Monsantos, the BAS, BASFs, um, the DuPonts, and so forth, and they reject it for the same kind of anti-corporate bias. So I really think that uh, the large majority of people don't make science-based decisions. They're, they they make, de make, make decisions based on their personal ideologies and what I would call their tribal views. When I say their tribal views, what people who are their friends believe in um, and who, premier people who are their friends actually provide a kind of comfort level. Um, I think the biggest change in the views on GMOs has come over the past few years when, when major former anti-GMOers have defected from their tribe. Mark Linus is a name that some of you might be familiar with, a famous um, anti-GMO uh, campaigner and journalist from Britain who very famously about two years ago um, broke from his long-standing anti-GMO position. He had been one of the most open people supporting climate change concerns. Um, and he says, look, I've been using um, science to support my climate change um, uh, views for so long, and yet I threw that out the window when it came to GMOs. Once I started applying the same science scrim to evaluating GMOs, I realized I could not continue what was then a, an ideological position. A, a major tribal member defected, and a lot of people changed along with him. So I think the changes that are going to occur is when high-profile, liberal-minded, whatever, progressives one by one, begin to come around and stand by the science. It's happened in the United States. Three, three years ago, not one major US newspaper had come out in support of the safety of GMOs. Over the past year and a half, every single major US newspaper, every single one, has come out for the safety of GMOs and opposed to mandatory labeling. That has come only because tribal members like um, Bill Nye, uh, Mark Linus, and others have said, you know, we're changing our views, and it gave cover, I think, for the um, liberal establishment to make those changes. Hopefully that'll happen as well. Next question from a scientist and journalist, uh, Dr. John Millard. Thank you, Larry. John Millard, our sound FM. Mr. Antone, it's some 20 years now since tr GMOs have been introduced into agriculture, particularly GMOs which are resistant to herbicides such as glyphosate, um, Roundup, um, Ready, Canola, Maize, etc. Sure. Now, since that time, there's been a rise of weeds which are resistant to those. Absolutely. Um, um, genes, uh, uh, that's to be expected because of selection pressures. Correct. But also plants are of course uh, incurably transgenic and many of these genes have escaped into the ecosystem where there's no such selection pressure uh, for say glyphosate genes. Now given um, that uh, GMOs, if contained in a much of manufacturing setup, of course, can be controlled and won't escape into the wild. Critics of GMOs in, in agriculture have said that their occur occurrence increasingly in the ecosystem um, have produced uh, possible and even identifiable ecological and environmental consequences. How would you answer such critics? Uh, actually, I think what you said, uh, I totally agree with the glyphosate issue. It's a very fascinating one, and we could talk about herbicide resistance and, and, uh, and, and, and the evolution of so-called superweeds, which in the United States, it's an interesting issue because the worst superweeds are with non-GMO plants. I think the single worst problem is with sunflower, uh, which is a conventionally uh, herbicide-resistant plant, and it's at least three to four times more herbicide-resistant problems with um, non-GMO uh, conventionally produced um, herbicides. 
But I, I think I, I actually will, will, will challenge you. I don't think that there's any um, significant examples of any so-called rogue escape of GMO products. That's a, that's a very familiar mem in the anti-GMO community. There just, hasn't, there just isn't widespread evidence of it. Um, there hasn't been any studies that show any particular problems related to that. It's a speculatory, a speculative issue. I recognize that it's, it's been posed, but there really isn't any signs of, of kind of rogue release of, of, of GMOs. Again, it is a constant mem that you see in anti-GMO um, uh, uh, stories, but there's no literature to support that there's any real problems on that. Uh, question now from James Kent. James Kent, UC Press Club. It's said we're living in an information age. Even in a broader context of, say, homeopathy or Chinese medicine, why is so much of that information wrong? Uh, well, thank the internet, I guess. Uh, it is our encyclopedia, Britannica. Um, anybody, uh, you know, any, anybody with $20 and a, and a, and a cheap uh, application can, can set up a website, and Google is very um, democratic. Uh, if a lot of people click on it, it's going to be high up in search engines and essentially has leveled the playing field so that at least in, we, you, you don't have people, we have notorious anti-GMO, anti-science celebrities. Some, Dr. Mehmet Oz, he may be a bit of a celebrity here as well. He's well known around the world. He's a uh, celebrity um, a doctor who used to be affiliated with uh, Oprah Winfrey, and he's very, very vocally anti-GMO. Um, and uh, when his show comes on, um, five to seven million people watch it. It's then replayed. Ultimately, he has an audience of 30 million people. Someone speaks at the National Academy of Sciences, and 1,809 people see it. I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's a real reality that the, uh, the Dr. Oz is. Uh, we have a woman called Food Babe. I'm sure you have people similar to that here. Um, Food Bay makes a statement, and uh, you can literally see the impact on sales. We've had companies uh, pull products because Food Bay has uh, created public, socially, um, social media-driven campaigns. Um, it's a sad state of affairs, but uh, it really means that science is not going to win this debate. Um, it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult challenge. Information is uh, very uh, democratic. Whoever can access it and promote it can create their own evidence. Food babe. Mm. Steve Lewis. <laughs> John, Steve Lewis. I'm a director at the National Press Club. Um, you may not be aware, but uh, the federal government has plans to develop Northern Australia. Um, recently outlined a white paper. Part of that is developing agriculture in, uh, in Northern Australia, and there's talk about Australia becoming a food bowl, particularly for Asia. I was going to ask you, um, it would seem, listening to your, your talk, that there probably is a role for GMO crops in terms of uh, helping develop northern Australia, uh, which is characterised as being hot and for at least uh, six months of the year pretty wet. Um, are, are there any examples that you're able to draw upon where similar uh, conditions um, have allowed uh, GMO to play a part in terms of developing agriculture and um, have you got any uh, thoughts on how that might be applied to northern Australia? Well, there's a lot of research going on, both conventional, by the way, and, and, and GMO related, on drought tolerance of aritals, on um, heat tolerant uh, varietals. Uh, it doesn't necessarily all, this, we're really not talking promoting genetic technology in and of itself. We're really promoting technology and trying to bring science to the best of agriculture. I don't think farmers really care. I don't think the Australian government really cares if it's something that's um, genetically modified or not. We're looking for safe and productive ways to increase yields. So there are um, experimentations going on. I mean, Asia is a test field for lots of. Um, uh, lots of experimentation. A lot of it is not genetic, genetic engineering. A lot of it is, uh, is, is coalitions between governments and scientists around the world. I, I'm at the Food Institute the, um, at uh, uh, UC Davis, the International Food and Agricultural Literacy uh, Project there, and it's headed by Pamela Ronald, who's a leading scientist in developing um, uh, drought-resistant uh, rice uh, varieties, and most of her work is not in, in GM. And her, her husband is a uh, organic farmer, and he's head of the organic program at the University of California, Davis. That's the future that we need. We need a future where organic um, ideas, agroecological ideas, and there are some good things from that. By the way, my criticisms of organic farming was less of farmers and more of the marketing of that, which I think many organic farmers who are very uh, noble in what they're doing are as, uh, as appalled by as, um, as, as many others are. But I think we really have to draw from, um, from all the tools 
on the, uh, in the organic um, deck, and that means uh, sustainable agriculture, whether it's developed by organic farmers or whether it's developed by conventional farmers. Tony Melville. Uh, Tony Melville, the director of the National Press Club. Um, just to start with a, a little anecdote, I was at the Orange Grove Markets in Sydney at the Nut Stall. It was a, it's a fresh food market. It's one of the electorates where uh, it's one of, one of the biggest green votes in Australia. And the woman next to me said uh, she'd like some almonds. And the girl behind the counter looked around, there were nuts everywhere, and she said, do you want organically grown or pesticide free? <laughs> and, uh, and the woman who was buying stopped silent. How much are they? And it was, uh, oh, the organically grown are $40 a kilo and it's $30 for the pesticide free. She said, silence again. You could see her fighting with the green in her. And she said, oh, give me the, give me the pesticide free. Now, which one would you have picked? I, I think probably neither. But um, you're not going to change... <laughs> You're not going to change minds with science and facts, as you've been talking about. It's like trying to change minds of anti-vaccinators and anti-fluoridators. Um, there's a, there must be another way. And um, I mean, you, you talked about the liberals changing the states, but you know, isn't it about changing, trying to change beliefs or demonstrating the feeding the poor, the third world? And well, I think that the, the focus of the talk tonight, today was really on sustainability issues. I think when when the debate shifts away from cold choices and you have to do cost-benefit analysis, then things change. Uh, the debate over nuclear energy, I think, is a very good one. Um, before the Japanese disaster, there was a shift, I think, in the liberal community, the progressive community, towards embracing nuclear energy. Why? Because a calculus was being made. Climate change was so severe that the advantages in cutting down carbon emissions by moving to nuclear energy made the risks that nuclear energy brought to the table worth um, suffering because all the advantages in cutting down greenhouse gas emissions. I think we have to do the same things with GMOs. Sure, no one wants to use pesticides if we don't have to, but if you weigh using pesticides, hopefully in a, in a, in a targeted kind of way, with all the advantages, um, lower input costs, um, you know, less use of water, which is increasingly becoming a crisis and will grow as a crisis issue in the coming years, a whole wide range of other things. People start making calculuses, and you could call it choosing your poisons, um, making choices over what things you really want. I think when those start, things start to happen, you're going to see a shift in public opinion. It's never going to come with lecturing people that GMOs are safe um, and that it's good for you. When they have to make hard choices about what they want for their families, I can't get everything, I have to make a choice. I think you're going to see more and more people choosing um, the technology and the benefits that it brings. Ken Randall. Uh, Mr. Rintan, Ken Randall from I sent here. Uh, the picture you've painted today is very similar to the one that's happened with the, the climate change debate. Um, I wonder what you think is feasible to turn public opinion around when, um, quite apart from the mainstream uh, habit that you've described of equivalence, which is rather false, uh, when so many people, particularly younger people, are getting their information, as they might describe it, from non-mainstream sources where, uh, you know, the uh, campaigners against the science have free reign. Yeah, it, this is a, a challenge. I'm not, if I had the answer to that, I'd... Uh... Um, you know, I'd be a hero and solve the uh, GMO debate overnight. It's not going to come very easily. I, I have to, I want to flip back to talk about something um, that, that may help provide some insight into, in, into that question. We, we have an odd situation, it seems, here in Australia where there's a, almost a hostility between organic farmers and conventional farmers. That does not exist in every country in the world. It does not exist um, in the United States. There is the organic marketing industry, which is extremely hostile to conventional agriculture. But organic farmers are very technologically savvy in the United States. They're very much concerned with the most advanced um, technological techniques. And they get along and they coexist very, very well with their neighbors. And we even have some amazing developments where we have some farms where a, a farmer has chosen to grow both organic crops and conventional crops, GMO crops, on his farm. Um, if you've been to Hawaii, Hawaii is a great success story for a GMO plant called the um, Hawaiian papaya, which about 20 years ago was threatened with extinction from a virus called the ring spot virus. There was no cure for the ring spot virus. The Hawaiian papaya was going to go extinct. Same kind of problem faces the, um, the orange, uh, Florida oranges right now, where GM technology may be the only way to address that problem. Uh, a 
a scientist, a local scientist from Hawaii who had um, studied at Cornell University, uh, got, some, got uh, Monsanto to give him for free the technology, uh, the promoter technology that allowed him to develop a, um, uh, an inoculation for the virus, and Hawaiian papaya, GMO papaya, was introduced, and the Hawaiian papaya has come from near extinction to becoming a very dominant crop, revived totally in Hawaii. You can go on farms in Hawaii now, and you can see on the same farm, in the middle of that farm, you'll see organic papaya being grown, and surrounding that, on the same farm, by the same farmer, GMO papaya surrounding it. Why is that? Because the GMO papaya prevents the ring spot virus from attacking that kind of papaya. But it also inoculates, by a halo effect, the ring spot virus from attacking the organic plants. So that farmer gets the advantage of having organic papaya, selling at a premium, and is also a GMO papaya grower as well. So you have coexistence on one farm by one farmer. That doesn't exist in Australia because there tends to be this hostility between the organic community and the conventional farming community. That has to end. I think we need some leadership by the Australian government to dial down some of the rhetoric and, frankly, increase education campaigns to make people understand that GMO agriculture, conventional agriculture, and organic agriculture can coexist. We can draw the best from both um, uh, technologies, I believe. Morris Riley. Uh, thanks, Laurie. Uh, thanks, John, for today. Um, some of the opponents of GMO crops don't dispute the benefits, but they are, they are becoming concerned about the growing corporatisation of the food chain. Um, are we opening a Pandora's box, that's that European disease, uh, by allowing a multinational corporation to own patents for those basic food staples like wheat, uh, maize, uh, corn? Um, and as a corollary to that, um, do you think future governments, Western governments in particular, will be forced down the same path that they had to deal with the pharmaceutical industry by forcing some of those patents off to uh, a generic uh, environment. And I suppose we've got China, uh, who probably are state-owned. So I'll be interested in that Western versus the, the, the other parts of the world and the, the issue of patents. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating question. I think um, it's putting it in a different perspective. I think people realize that GM seeds are patented. Um, and I think that's one of the major criticisms that you see by anti-GMOers. Look, you know, Monsanto essentially buys uh, or owns um, farmers who decide to um, choose a, uh, a GM seed system. Uh, it's used all the time about um, turning people into seed slaves. I referred to that in my, in my story. Uh, what you have to realize, I think, is that seed patenting has been going on for almost 90 years now, since the early 1930s. Uh, hybrid seeds are patented. Um, most organic farmers use patented hybrid seeds. So this is, not, this is not a GMO issue. This is a farming issue. Monsanto's market, for instance, or, or Syngenta's market, or Pioneer's market, is huge in organic seeds, just as it is in, in uh, GMO seeds. So this is a general issue. But patents only last for so long. Uh, many of the Roundup Ready um, uh, crops uh, that were the centerpiece of GM agriculture in the United States and uh, in many countries, um, Brazil, Argentina, for instance, are all going off patent, started this year. That's going to increasingly happen. Now, what does is, what is Monsanto, what do these other companies do? They um, come out with new varieties that have added benefits to try to entice farmers into using those, but the non-patented seeds are still out there. And if you don't need the latest car, if you don't have to buy the latest uh, uh, BMW, and you can get last year's BMW, you can buy last year's um, Roundup Ready that's uh, no longer patented. So there's that issue. Um, this is a very, 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 very contentious issue. There's no question about it. I, I think navigating the concerns over who controls agriculture is, is, is part of the debate. It's a reasonable part of the debate. I don't think anyone wants to see it. But let's be clear. Part of the reason that we have this system is because that's exactly what anti-GMO activists want. They've created a system, and I quoted it in my piece, 135, $136 um, billion dollars a uh, billion dollars, million dollars, to get a, uh, a GMO product approved. They've created a system that if you want a new product, you have to run a regulatory gauntlet that is so long and so dangerous that only if you are a large multinational can you get it approved because the regulatory system is so onerous. The way to break the monopoly of large corporations is to have a 
21st century regulatory system that recognizes that GMOs are safe. If we rationalize the system, if we take advantage of the opportunity with new breed technology and have rational regulatory schemes that don't set up a 13-year system for approving a crop. In the case of the United States, GM salmon, 19 years were going on to get a GM salmon approved. We have a system that's been created by activists. Now they flog the system that claiming that only rich corporations can um, create uh, seeds. They have the system exactly what they want. They have, a, they have a, a, a way to flog and create controversy over a situation that they've created. So I think we have an opportunity now. Let's get a refined, more efficient regulatory system that allows smaller companies to get in and bring some competition to the multinationals. I couldn't finish today without asking you the one question that hasn't been asked, and that is, how on earth did you and your daughter become fans of the AFL? And, and what is it that actually, you know, took you to the position where you've been tarred with the stripes of black and white of Collingwood? Really, I, I did warn you that uh, my magpie team will be attacking people coming out of here. If we're <laughs> disparaging. I, I'm, I'm a working class guy, although I can tell you. But, you know, look, you give your daughter a choice between the bulldogs, the magpies. No one's ever heard of the magpies in the United States. They're Australian magpies. We're magpie fans. Sorry. I'll live with my choices. We'll, we'll Thank you very much. Point. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Uh, I'm sure there'll be, um, perhaps not in this room, but certainly viewers who hold an opposing view, but I hope that they did listen to you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to offer our guests membership of the club, and particularly one uh, with a background such as yours. So welcome to the National Press Club. I hope you accept the membership that Absolutely. I offer you. Absolutely, thank you. I'm and and, and a, co a copy of our 50th anniversary book, which, uh, which traces uh, um, the most important events, predominantly speeches which have occurred here over the last, uh, well, now more than half a century of this club. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, Steve Lewis, you the No, I'm good. The lady, oh. oh, okay.